It's Feedback Gaming. Welcome back to my tutorial series for the Soviet Union. Okay, so I messed up. I deleted the save game by mistake. So I had to play from the beginning all the way to this point, trying to re-emulate what I did. Uh, it was the 2nd of March when the game ended. It's the 4th of March now. Whoops. Uh, we still have the Soviet Turkish puppet. And uh, the front's just moved, so I've not moved my troops over to it yet. The armies aren't as organized as well because we've been making mountain divisions, more mountain divisions than we actually need, which is actually going to come in handy because I'm going to explain that a little bit later. So the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to find out how many troops we need. So what I'd like, ideally, is two full generals with full 24 division stacks. So we talked before about how a general has a maximum capacity of divisions of 24. So what will happen if they have more than 24 divisions under their, assigned under them, as it says there, it will reduce their positive leader trait and their skill modifiers. So this won't be as big and the modifiers won't be as big as well as it's more than they can control. So that's not good. So. What I'd like to do ideally, to benefit from the general skills, just to let you know, the general skills are way better than the field marshal skills. The, the Soviet ones you get are old guards, which give a penalty to how much experience they gain, but give a little bit more max entrenchment. I assume the game's trying to, I don't know, saying that their, their minds are still set in the old days of maybe World War I thinking where trench warfare it was the way war was gonna be conducted so i'll be honest with you if i see old guard i just don't want to go anywhere near that i don't want to go anywhere near it so what i'm going to do instead of creating a new field marshal which we can do by promoting we're going to assign two generals with 24 stacks divisions 24 divisions and is it out oh, there it says it's so a leading too many units all stats reduced by 0.2 percent to be honest with you, that's not actually a big reduction. That's actually quite small. So, I don't know, I could probably get away with having more. But no, I'd much prefer to have two generals. Why? Because at least then we're going to gain two experience for two separate generals. So what I'm going to do is we're going to split it directly in half. That's 22 divisions, so we'll assign another two. Uh, that's the sign. I took them off. One, two. So 24 divisions. We'll pop them there. So we've got a 19 and a 24. What we'll do is assign this to a new theater. Uh, I think we'll just call it theater two for now. So the 19 guy, him, and we'll right click and pop them onto the new theater. So both of our mountain divisions now are assigned to this specific theater. So what I'm gonna do, first of all, is I'm gonna assign my mountain divisions to this little front here off Turkey. And then my other stack, which are currently on uh, garrison duty here I'm gonna put them on the Japanese border because we do know by clicking on the faction button that they are part of the axis so they're in a they're in an alliance with the Germans and the Italians so we are aware that if they do declare war on us all three of them are more than likely going to go declare war on all at the same time it's not always the case you have an option if you're in a faction whether you want to join wars or not but the most case from my experience of playing this game we have found out that the ai will join the factions anyway so select a front line for the 24 stack here left click on the manchurian japanese border and you can see it's going to create a border all the way around and just for the sake of building planning bonus, which we talked about before, we are going to assign an offensive line, which will just grab, I don't know, we'll grab this, this province here, which has a port. Okay, and you can see if you look closely, no divisions assigned. Okay, in that case, if no divisions have been assigned, you select the edit mode, and then you click on it. No, is it edit mode? No, it's a sign button. I usually hit control. I know the hotkeys better than the actual buttons. So it's control, and then you left click, and then you see 24 divisions for Army 2 are assigned. You can see Army 2. To make life a lot easier, what you might be better off doing is assigning names. I, I don't really get into that very much. What we'll do is we'll, we'll give an assignment. So let's say Eastern Front. And uh, we'll give them their own theater, and we'll literally call it the Eastern Front. So the Eastern Front is going to see less action, okay? They're literally here just to defend the border to stop the Japanese from pushing out aggressively and grabbing land in Siberia. 
So what we'll say is we'll set their reinforcements to a low priority. Now, just to recover over territory we've already been over, but low priority means that any upgrades of equipment, any reinforcements that are going to arrive will be given to the lowest priority last. So that makes sense. The frontline troops get the guns first. The ones behind that are the reserves or holding the line somewhere else. Get them last. I guess it makes life really easy. Okay, so what we also want to do is assign a general to this guy. There's absolutely no reason you wouldn't want to assign a general, unless you maybe have very few of them. But as the Soviet Union, you get a... A huge number of selection. So what I'm typically looking for really is I'm just looking for one that's got a high skill level. Having a trait is also kind of cool. But I'm just looking for one who's got a high number. See, these guys have got experience. That means they've been in battles. So their skills leveled up and they've gained extra traits as well. So I think what we're going to go for is probably there's a guy here that's three. He's a winter specialist, which reduces the attrition in winter. I don't think there's going to be an issue in this province with winter. But you know what? He's got a trait. Let's use it. This one reduces out of supply. Now that is useful and we will use that a little bit later. So we're going to select that. Okay. So these guys now, these divisions are going to assign to this front. They're going to go over to here and they're going to start building up a planning bonus to attack. Now I am not necessarily going to use this attack bonus because if I click this button, they will try and execute their order if we're at war. Now we're not at war so nothing would actually happen. But... I, I, I like to set an attack plan just for the sake of building up planning bonus because it is kind of useful on the defensive as well as on the offensive. Awesome. So that's the Eastern Front. So I think what we'll do, so these guys are our extra mountain teams and we've assigned them to this front. So is this the same front? We're just going to delete this. I think I may have assigned it to a different army. I think I have, yeah. Yeah, I'll assign it to this guy. And that's okay. So, this guy's selected. The pink guy. The pink mountain guy. So, I use the hotkeys normally in game. Usually when you see me on stream or on YouTube, I use the hotkeys. So, I don't, you, can't, you don't see me hit these buttons. But I'll just do it for the demonstration of this game. So, I'll left click the front line. Make the front line, which is the one between Bulgaria and Turkey. And also set an offensive line, which is going to go for Sofia. Now, we know... The Greeks, more than likely, historically, align themselves with the Allies. Now, we're, gonna, we're not going to be at war with the Allies, so we don't need to worry about that. Now, on the other hand, we know historically, the Bulgarians are more likely to join the Axis, which align themselves with fascism, and we're more likely to be at war with them. So that's the reason why we're supposed to go on the border of Bulgaria. So we are missing five divisions here to get the full the full maximum of 24. There is no extra bonus to get in the full amount, but it's just nice, I guess, I don't know, maybe it's me being a little bit OCD, but I like to have the fuller numbers, the full actual amount. So what we'll do is we will check our production screen. Here we go. So we now have four in production, so that'll bring it to 23. So we'll add an extra one, so that means we're gonna train an extra division. We're gonna set this to a priority. So that means we wanna do this one first. And also, we're going to say that don't keep producing these forever and a day. Don't just keep producing them over and over again. This is a limit to say, after one row of these is complete, remove them. So these one, these four are almost done. So we're going to produce one more row of each one of these. And then they will remove them until this line of production of mountain division ends. Now, if I wanted to say, okay, let's go for two. So in that case, they'll produce another ten divisions. Because one, two, three, four, five times two. And it'll try and produce them all the way down. But we just want one more row. And that's what we're going to do. What else you can do from the screen. Is you can left click on this assign button here. And you can left click on where you'd like them to go. So what you'll do is the minute they spawn. Which is in Penzan. I've just right clicked and removed it. Let's assign it again. Uh, we'll say we'll spawn them here in Georgia. So what happens is, is when they're fully retrained and fully got all their equipment, they will spawn in this location. In this case, it'll, they will spawn on the 5th of March, so that's tomorrow. And the minute they spawn, we'll get them, assign them an order. And what you can do is you left click on this and then assign to a plan. So in that case, assign them to this plan. You see it's gone pink for the same color as the general. So what will happen is when they spawn, they will automatically be assigned the order and they will automatically join this general. I'm going to hit space now and you can see the next day. Boom, here you go, one of them's deployed, and if you notice, he on is on his way to go towards this general. Okay. What else do we need to... Also, note as well that we signed only one more row of divisions for this, um, this line of training. So you notice it's now it's gone from five rows to four rows when every single one gets depleted. Alright, okay. 
So that's our eastern front. Uh, we should say this is the Turkey front. What I don't like to do is give the armies a name of a region because technically they're not going to stay there for the whole game. You're going to constantly get into and rename them. So I'm just going to call this the Southern Front. Yep, that's perfect. Um, yep. I don't know, let's give these guys kind of a colour as if they are mountaineers. Let's go for a... I don't like the super brown colours. Let's go for something a bit brighter. I don't really feel like I need to explain this, do I? I guess you, what you can do here as well is you can assign the colour you'd like it. So you've got lots of variations. And you can also assign the icon you'd like it to be. I don't know, there's loads of icons. In the latest patch, they've added a load of new ones. Um, there's only about four now. Let's go for the... Is that a rock icon? Yeah, let's do that. And um, we'll maybe give this a different color as well. These guys in the east, we'll give those. In fact, we'll give these a rook icon as well. Then we we'll then we know these are our mountain divisions. It makes them more easily labeled. So as I said to you guys, I had to reload the save. So, so some of the things aren't the same as they once were from the previous game. I've had to make some adjustments and tweaks. So one thing I've actually adjusted is the Japanese-Chinese war wasn't going that well. No, the Chinese were losing. They were getting obliterated. And before, their front line was about here for the Japanese, and everything to the west of that was Chinese. Now, it's a lot worse, and the Japanese are pushed further forward, and also, they, they had literally held all of Manchuria where the Chinese had forced them into Korea before. So, I had to send some volunteers. So, they're exactly the same way as it did before, as I did it before, with the Spanish Civil War, I clicked and I sent volunteers. I could send a maximum of five, but now it's telling me I can send a maximum of ten. And I am exactly going to do that. I am not involved in any wars right now, so why not? Let's send some volunteers and let's help out the Chinese. One thing also I want to do as well is I want to start pushing China towards communism. I think on my previous game I'd already started doing that, but I'm going to have to start doing it again now. So we're going to boost pa pa party popularity and go communism. Now this was driven by 0 0.13, 0 0.13. I don't think that's a percentage, that's just a, an amount. And, and it will cost 0 0.25 political power per day. Now, I think I explained this before, but I'm going to go over it really quickly. There's a special event in this game that if China gets a large amount of communism built within its political alignment, if it becomes very popular, States within China will start to be ripped off and be given to the People's Republic of China. It's just built into the code, it's built into the game. I'm actually worried actually that if they lose this battle and they lose their capital, the uh, the Chinese the Chinese communists may actually lose. But that won't matter anyway because we'll be able to flip them to communism anyway. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go back to base. We're going to grab five divisions. I'll do. Split them off into this army. And then we're going to send as many divisions as we possibly can to help out the Chinese. So volunteers, extra five divisions, send, go. And what we're going to plan on doing is ignore this front and we're just going to push into Manchuria and push them out of Korea. That'll create one united front against the Japanese and it'll help out the Chinese massively. Right. Now, just prior to the previous game, I assigned them onto this front as I did before. Uh, I also showed you before how to move the front line. So, this is what we've assigned. I selected the offensive line. I selected it on Warsaw, but this is kind of wonky. I want to go straight line. So, we're going to grab this corner right on the back of our front line and drag it back to where we want it to be, which is pretty much near enough a straight line. Yet again, if you hover over it, you can actually see how they're going to push forward. And they come very united and they kind of spearhead into a kind of a V shape towards Warsaw, which is exactly what we want. Okay, what else is there? So, there's a few things that will be behind on our production by, okay? We are sending a massive amount of guns to China right now, so we are a little bit lagging behind on guns. But one thing we are massively behind on is definitely artillery. So we can't ignore that. We're 6,000 pieces of artillery behind. So if you go to logistics here and hover over the, uh, the stored amount, which is 6,300, we're 871 days behind. So that is is not realistic at all. We need to at least be within a year, if not less. Tanks, we're behind by 165 days. Still, that's a concern, but it's not much of a concern. It's just a bit of a problem. I just realized I've left some planes behind now. I'm going to get rid of those. Just don't want to confuse things. Um, yeah. What else are we behind on? That's pretty much it, actually. I want to keep these guns to the bottom 
and if we get any new factories assign them to these tank divisions we are currently producing more factories and we are building roads as we originally planned to now there are a few roads here that we don't need i deleted those on my previous play let me get rid of those we need that one we need that one that one that one that one that one not that one so I feel like I might need to explain myself a little bit what I'm doing here because this probably is very confusing if you don't know what I'm doing. So if you click on the supply area mode, as I talked about, each of these is a supply region indicating by the maximum supply with the right number and how much supply is currently being used by the left number. And if you go above the right number, you start to get a penalty. Uh, if it's a small penalty, it's only about 10% reduction in attack and defense. And there's a big penalty that's about 40 or 50% as well. That's if you go way, way, way over the maximum supply. But if you hover over it, you can actually see where the supplies are coming from. So what I'm actually trying to do is I'm trying to prioritize, because all supplies come from Moscow, because that's your capital, and get prioritized through these angles. So I was wanting to make sure this region is maxed out. So remember, this region is, is a supply region with three states. So that state has five infrastructure. This one has five. This one has five. So if we made this 10 on all these, it would max it out. But don't forget, you're also you're only capped by the maximum amount of supply from the previous province as well. So if you can max out the supply in this province, which is good, it'll make the supply higher, but potentially the best thing to do is to make every province sequentially before the capital to be as higher as well. So that way you'll get the highest maximum amount of supply to the provinces that you need it. Now I know there's gonna be inevitable attack. The Germans are eventually gonna go for Operation Barbarossa and push all the way into Soviet Union. So I know they're gonna be here. So I wanna hold them back for as long as humanly possible. And to do that, we're gonna build up as much infrastructure and not have any concerns with supply. Now there are a few other things we could do as well. We could build land forts. So if you say that every land fort will reduce the attack penalty by minus 15%. So what I can do, it might look like these are all states, but actually you place forts in in actual provinces, not the states themselves. So in this case, the production cost is quite high because you've got to place them on every single province. Now they are quite cheap, but be aware as well, tanks for the most part ignore the penalty for the forts. They still have to pay a penalty. They don't they don't get as much attack attacking to forts, but that's the that's the genius of tanks. Tanks literally it for the most part, ignore a large amount of the penalty that forts provide. So forts, they're kind of an old way of thinking. The offense has, is its own special defense. But to be fair, the Germans are going to be the tougher ones here. So let's just build one row and let's see how we... We, not, we might not even get down all the way down to here before we start building these forts. But this will just demonstrate how to build forts. It's quite useful if you're building one for like a really narrow front here. That, uh, the production cost is that quite low and because it's also if I press this icon you can see these are mountain and hill provinces the, the benefit is just massive also be aware that you can have a maximum level of forts in in a province of 10 so you could scale that minus 15% up to a maximum based on 10 so you can click each time each click will add an extra province or you can just shift click and it maxes it to 10 but be aware you have to build each fort one at a time before you max out per province that is kind of the reason why the magic line here is so difficult to break and you can even see the germans are struggling to get through this province here if you click on each one you can see they've got 10 forts 10 10 10 10 that one doesn't have a 10 because they've already broken through but what you'll find as well is if you keep attacking forts over and over again, you will break them. And that will mean that you can eventually get through them. Uh, I can't show you on here, but it will appear as like a red icon that a fort's damaged and you can prioritize repair it. Okay, wow. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground here. So we've sent that, we're sending some more volunteers to the Chinese war. We have a few bit of research here that we're backdated on. So as I said to you before, at the very start of the game, you can save a maximum of 30 days. I wasn't actually too sure what research I was researching at the time when I was playing the game. I've kind of guessed. These ones we were going for. So now what we're going to do is going to go for some text and we're going to get an extra little bit of a bonus. 30% days that's going to be added to the first research that we go for. So there's a few things we want to go for. Um, first of all, we want to go for the better variant of tank, the T-34. I would say that's probably one of the most memorable Soviet tanks. I, I not kid me if I'm wrong, but I believe that... Now tell me if I'm wrong, but... I believe this was the most mass-produced tank in World War II. 
Okay, so this tank wasn't historically produced until 1941. It is 1940 in March, so that's actually quite early. So what it's making me aware that if I do research this, is it ahead of time? Now, we haven't really researched ahead of time yet, but we're going to use this as the first example. So what this is doing is it adds an extra ahead of time penalty of 164%, and that's quite high. We're still going to go for it anyway. It's 236 days. Halfway through the year, we'll start producing T-34s, and then we'll be able to upgrade our A-32s to T-34s. So we're going to start researching that. We get a little bit of a boost as well, because those 30 days were saved, so they've been all basically banked into the T-34. What else can we go for? So infantry... Now, these are a bit ahead of time. One, almost two years ahead. Two years, two years, a bit too far ahead. Now, you do start off with motorized. Let me see if I can find motorized. There it is. So this is what you companion your tanks with to give them a lots of organization. And the combination of motorized vehicles and tanks is a perfect match. The reason why is because motorized are fast and tanks are fast too and you can only travel at the slowest possible speed so motorized are awesome paired with tanks now motorized eventually do get replaced by mechanized mechanized are like armored personnel vehicles and i'm gonna be honest with you i'm a bit rusty on the historical significance of mechanized but i believe the whole idea was that instead of infantry having to leave a vehicle to fight the whole wide concept was mechanized is that the infantry could fight in the vehicle aka armored personnel carriers and armored fighting vehicles and infantry fighting vehicles and whatnot so it kind of shows like the the evolution of warfare the evolution of doctrines as a part of warfare so we're going to select mechanize as one. Be aware this is ahead of time by 0.82 years. So we are suffering from a penalty. But the cool thing is the earlier we get this, we can start making mechanized vehicles and starting replacing motorized. And we'll explain how to do that later. So let's research mechanize. We've got four and final research slot that we've not got. What do we need? These are two years ahead, so they're a bit too far ahead. I don't really want to be doing that. Um, there's no tanks we can get. Be aware, though, there is three variants of tanks. There's light, mediums, and heavies. Now, for the most part, I would say most games revolve around mediums. They're the best of both. They've got speed, they've got breakthrough, they've got attack, and they're relatively, um, I suppose, relatively inexpensive to produce. I, I guess that's an exaggeration, really. I mean, they are, for the most part, still pretty pricey in comparison to light tanks. Light tanks are just a tiny bit cheaper. Now, light tanks under the hand get a speed advantage over medium tanks. You can see there, this one has a speed of 8.4 kilometers per hour, but the T60 has 14.7 and 12 for the model behind it. As time goes on, though, the speed does catch up. But you still do find that the light tanks are the uh, the fastest ones of them all. But they don't have as much attack, they don't have as much breakthrough, but they are cheaper. So I suppose that's kind of a reason to go for... If you are a small nation, maybe you want to go for the final model of the light tank, the light tank 3, which is the 941 one, you might want to do that, because that will give you the, the advantage of having tanks, which is modern and up-to-date, and you get that armor and attack and armor advantage and breakthrough, and the production is relatively low. Not that much low, but still relatively low. Okay. Finally, heavy tanks are tanks that have a considerably huger production cost. I must say the difference is massive. Because if you look at the pr first model of light tanks, 8 for per tank, 8 production cost per tank. The first heavy tank, 25. Now, I, I am not a big fan of heavy tanks. And I, I don't feel like I've experimented with them enough to actually find where they fit in. But you need a country with lots of production to make heavy tanks. So, from my experience, I, I feel like I, I don't really know where they fit in. There is also a final variant of tank called the Super Heavy Tank. And this tank is not built for speed. This tank is just built for brute force. The production cost is 100. The speed is slower than... It's, it goes slower than how infantry can move. But the attack damage, the breakthrough, the hardness, the defense, the armor are all massive and if you look the resource cost per production of this is also really really huge i've never made super heavy tanks uh it's the same reason i don't really make heavy tanks the production cost is huge and i feel like you could invest that production to something something more i don't know there are other things you could produce with that kind of production cost that would be more in handy and helpful than just a super heavy or a heavy tank maybe one day we'll do some kind of heavy tank super heavy tank build and see how it goes all right, sorry, I've gone on a tangent there. So we're going to research the next version of Land Doctrine, which is 
a Kampafraken. Kampafrop? I think that's how it's pronounced. Anyway, so it gives extra planning speed. Um, recovery rate for all infantry and mechanized an organization which we're going to go for. We're always going to work our way down and we are going to work our way down and modern Blitzkrieg as well gives extra bonuses so we're going to go for that. I don't want to talk too much about doctrines because I have made a video dedicated to doctrines. If you want to learn more about land doctrines look up, look in the tutorial playlist on my YouTube channel and find the video about land doctrines. It's like a little basic tutorial that explains what they're used for and what scenarios. I've gone for the one that's based around tanks mobile warfare and moving super fast. Anyway, we're going to organize our divisions as well. So we'll make another division of solely tanks and we're going to assign it to a tank general. Where is this tank general? We have probably got another one somewhere. These ones that are got the the diagonal lines, these means they've already been assigned. Now you can un unassign them if you wish, but it'll pull it off another uh, army. Uh, I think we've got another guy somewhere. No, I don't think we have. I think what will happen is we'll wait for our other guy to come back and then we'll assign him. I think this armor will be okay being unassigned. If you are producing new divisions and you are aware if they're not assigned to an army, because there's no point having a division that's unassigned. It's pointless. So if you click on army and then click on this filter to click army, you can actually find any divisions that are unassigned. If they weren't assigned, there wouldn't be an icon there. I feel like I've already talked about this. I'm covering old territory, but that just gives you a bit of an idea. That's interesting as well, because that actually shows if it's in combat. And if you right-click on it, it'll move to where it is, and you can see it's, this tank is pushing into this province. Okay. Wow, we've covered so much ground here. Um, and we've not actually played any of the game yet. Okay, let's just go for modified government because we've got extra political power. There's no point just having it sit there. So one thing we said we were going to do is we were going to go for war economy. So this reduces the amount of production costs for consumer goods, which means we get more civilian factories for construction. And it also improves the construction speed by an extra 10%. From 10% to 20% for military factories. So we're going to do that. We also have another high command. Let's see who we can go for. So we've got paratroopers. Uh, Ace Generation, Capital Ships, Submarine Attack, Amphibious Landing. Ooh, now these are two gun ones. Uh, the Airborne's guy is pretty cool. I think I'm going to go for the Amphibious Landing. We will talk about Amphibious Assaults later in this campaign, because we are going to do one. I've got one planned in my head, and uh, yeah, we'll go from there. We've still got some more political power, so let's spend it. So I think we'll go for a Ship Designer. Or we can go for an aircraft designer. Hmm. None of those particularly jump out at me. I'm not going to explain the stats because there's too much. I honestly, fairness, guys, you could just hover over these in games and see what these particularly do. Um, I, I don't really want to go through every set. It'll take absolutely forever. Yeah, as I said, I'm trying to keep this tutorial nice and concise. Get to the point. I don't want to be baffling on, running on about numbers forever in a day. Anyway, so we're going to go back to ship design. This reduces research time. I doubt we're ever going to use that, but we're filling the slots out in all our production research and cabinet and whatnot. Okay, so can we go now? So it says missing equipment for fire and tactical bomber. We're not going to worry about that because we're not making any planes anyway. We'll save that for another day. And also we are making... Oh, that's interesting. So we're making anti-tank pieces, but the game's reminding us that you don't have that assigned to any division. So those tank pieces are going directly into storage. There you go. So we're producing 0.6 pieces of anti-tank equipment. And we have 12 pieces in storage because they're not going to get assigned to a division. So they're just going to sit there. And I'm okay with that because I want to produce a large amount of anti-tank. So therefore, I will add them to my infantry divisions in future if need be. Okay, I think I delete. I haven't deleted some of these extra ones. This was what, I did that on my previous game. We're going to keep the paratroopers because we may need that later. Wink, wink. We are still producing tank divisions. That's fine. And we are still sending equipment to China, which we definitely need to do. Okay, I'm going to resume the game now. I'm going to play at slightly slower speed. Just let me know about the reinforcements. I'm sending uh, China with some new divisions. Now, the crucial point of this, I talked about national unity. But when national unity drops below a certain threshold, aka 0%, they will give up. And more than likely, this province here, the capital of, of China, if it's lost... They'll lose 20 victory points, which is a huge amount of victory points. And more than likely, that will call them to end the game. So I don't want them to lose that. But I'm focusing on the north at the moment. I want to split the Japanese in two. I want to make them to fight a two-front war, which I am doing that now. As you can see, we're winning these two battles here. The Japanese are attacking into my tank division here, and we're winning. And our, ja our tank division is attacking into here and winning. Now, this one, on the other hand, is undecided because it's yellow. And they're still fighting. And then the game decides that I am winning this one now so it's green be aware that these this is just a, a guide 
this number in most cases is wrong. Uh, there's been numerous instances where it looks like you're winning and then it just gets turned around either through reinforcements or just loot running out of organization. Okay, so I think we'll play a little bit of this and then we'll end this episode here. The People's Republic of China is capitulating. Now that is these provinces. Now that is a pain because that means we've split our forces into two. They've kind of, in a weird kind of wonky way, they've actually encircled us. Now we can't lose this province now. This province is crucial. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to select all these divisions, or we can just click on the army. We're going to right-click on delete orders, which just deletes all orders. And then what we're going to do is assign a front line here. So look, this is exactly what I didn't want to happen. Actually, now I think about it, we might be getting reinforcements through Mongolia because they're part of our faction. So that might be the reason why I'm still getting supply. You'll normally get indicated by a supply icon here, like a jerry can, or you'll get a jerry can icon that appears like a red icon next to your division to indicate you're out of supply. Anyway, we're moving our guys over here. We're going to sign a front line, which is going to be very adventurous. Let's go there. And what will happen is when our reinforcers arrive, which will be somewhere here, we'll make a dual push from here, southern, southwise, and also we'll have our own divisions push into here, so we'll kind of We'll close this pocket ever so slightly, put more pressure on it, and at the same time, we'll keep the two front war going. Alright. Alright, guys. Well, that's pretty much the end of this episode. I am really sorry not a lot happened. I needed to catch up on a lot of things we've not already done. Uh, but for the most part, you can see those divisions are moving over. That icon means they're railroading, means they're moving really quick. And they're going to hold the border around here. We're not at war with Japan, so that's not a concern. Alright guys, if you have enjoyed this episode, remember to like and subscribe. Drop a comment below if anything you don't quite understand, you'd like me to go over with you again. Or anything that I've explained really, really badly and you, and you feel like I made an absolute mess of it. Drop a comment below and let me know what it is. Also guys, if you do subscribe, if you're on mobile, click on the bell icon. And if you're on desktop, after you've subscribed, click on the cog icon. Then click on the tick box to be notified when I upload next. Guys, I hope you all have a good day. I'll see you next episode and I'll see you soon. Goodbye. Bye.